All right. Thank you for joining today. We're talking about the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic, we, this is the outline. We'll talk about the general properties, the anatomy, uh, effects on target organs and central control. That's the outline of our lecture today. When you hear the word autonomic, what jumps into your head? Autonomic. Are there any other words that jump into your head? Good, I've got automatic, excellent, breathing, yes, automatic, yes. So functions that are done unconsciously without our conscious effort. Excellent. And breathing is indeed one of those things, as is contraction of smooth muscles. So here is an autonomic nerve fiber, and this is just to show you as an introduction what an autonomic function might look like. The end of the nerve fibers branch considerably to all of these smooth muscles. These are all smooth muscle cells, and smooth muscle works together. So having many varicosities and many extensions innervating a lot of smooth muscles at the same time ensures smooth, smooth muscle contraction. So a varicosity is just simply uh, an outgrowth of the nerve ending itself with lots of vesicles here that you can see that will um, emit neurotransmitters. And there are also many mitochondria in these varicosities that are generating energy for nerve function. Yeah, so um, smooth muscle is involuntary. You don't consciously contract smooth muscle. You consciously contract skeletal muscle, but not smooth muscle. What is the name of the other muscle that you don't consciously contract that occurs autonomically or automatically? Cardiac muscle, good. So then if it's so automatic, then what causes smooth muscle cont contract? What what are the signals for smooth muscle to contract? Well, sometimes it's as simple as the stretching of the bladder, for example. Stretching can cause them to contract. Um, so I'll put here example bladder, stretching of the bladder wall will contract the muscles and, and assist in micturation, which is the name for urination. Stretching chemicals. Things like hormones can trigger smooth muscle to contract. Some smooth muscle has a pacemaker cells. And they even regulate the pace of smooth muscle contraction. And there may be up to 20,000 varicosities for one nerve fiber in smooth muscle contraction. It's very organized. Well, that's an example of an autonomic function. These are very general properties. So sympathetic, we've said, is also known as fight or flight response. You might have seen that in the video. That's sympathetic. Parasympathetic. Also known as rest and digest.
So generally, this is very general though, there are antagonistic effects of the autonomic nervous system of these two systems. So if you can imagine yourself in a fight or flight situation, you're gonna stand, you're gonna fight, or you're gonna get the heck out of there and run like mad. Um, in both cases, you're going to need to exercise some of your muscles. And to do that, you'll need a greater heart rate, you'll need uh, more blood to the area so your vessels will dilate. Um, so dilated pupils. Relaxing the bronchi. These are to assist breathing, vision, and the glucose release for energy. Accelerated heartbeat, increased heart rate. So that, those are what you would, would expect in a, in a fight or flight kind of situation. Yeah, and parasympathetic. Pupils tend to be contracted. The bronchi contracted. The heartbeat slower, but the digestive system is stimulated. That's what you might expect with a name like the rest or digest system. So let's write some notes. The autonomic nervous system, otherwise known as ANS. It is a motor system. It is a motor system that responds to signals. And it controls not skeletal muscle, but rather glands, cardiac, and smooth muscle. It's also called sometimes the visceral motor system. And that distinguishes it from um, the somatic motor system. So somatic is voluntary, visceral is involuntary. The primary targets of this system are viscera, organs and glands of the thoracic and abdominal cavities. Cutaneous or under the skin, blood vessels, sweat glands, and piloerector muscles. The muscles that make your hair stand on end, or in our case, um, your make, gives you goosebumps. So every, every hair follicle has its own little muscle called a piloerector muscle. primary function, if you were to give it an overall function, um, is to regulate whoops, I shouldn't say primary. Uh, a 
function, <laughs> not the only function. A function is to regulate homeostasis. Regulate homeostasis. Things like blood pressure, temperature. What is our normal temperature? What is a normal temperature? Thirty-seven, somewhere between thirty-six and thirty-eight degrees Celsius. Yes. So, the autonomic nervous system um, and the endocrine system regulate that temperature around a set point. So, thirty-seven is a set point. Sometimes it's above. Sometimes it's below. Homeostasis. Very important, of course. And it occurs uh, without conscious input. Although the central nervous system does have some control, it is not conscious control. Um, have you ever heard of biofeedback? Biofeedback. So those are uh, techniques, in particular um, instruments, instruments um, produce visual or auditory signals in response to changes in a subject's heartbeat, for example. And it can give a person awareness of an autonomic function like changing heartbeat um, so that the person may be able to control it. So you can control heartbeat by relaxing your body, uh, stopping exercising. So, there is the possibility of training some of these autonomic functions. It's the premise of the, the lie detector, actually, the polygraph. It's the premise of the polygraph. Generally, you can't control your heart rate. If you're, if you're lying, <laughs> your heart rate goes up. You're, you start to sweat, some people start to sweat. I can't lie. If I try, my face gets really red. <laughs> Terrible liar. Yeah, so the autonomic nervous system, it's a kind of reflex arc. Uh, a reflex arc. So in other words, receptors will detect internal stimuli. Things like changing heart rate, uh, blood pressure changes, um, even chemical changes in the body. And afferent neurons carry that signal to the central nervous system. And then the ANS, the autonomic nervous system, responds. 
two, either glands if that's what, what's required, a smooth or cardiac muscle. I have to write muscle small because I didn't leave myself enough room. <laughs> I don't know if you remember when you were a kid, my niece did this not too long. Well, actually quite a long time ago. She's 24 now. So she, she made a poster for, for lemonade. She was selling lemonade on the street corner. <laughs> and uh, she only got the, the lemon part horizontally on the poster. So she had to put aid on the side. <laughs> You probably remember doing that at some point in your childhood. Yeah, so let's look at an example, high blood pressure. So the arteries have stretch receptors. They're known as baroreceptors. A barometer uh, measures air pressure, for example, atmospheric pressure. We have blood pressure detectors. And that signal is transmitted to the central nervous system via the glossopharyngeal nerve. Here to the medulla and the pons. The responding nerve, and this is a responding nerve that's really instrumental in a lot of autonomic uh, functions, the vagus nerve responds. And the heart rate decreases. So why would the heart rate decrease as a response to increased blood pressure? So lower heart rate, less blood being pumped to the body in um, sequence. So there's a whole different reflex arc if the blood pressure is low. So the divisions of the autonomic nervous system are parasympathetic, that's the rest and digest, and sympathetic, fight or flight. The sympathetic division prepares you for physical activity. Fighting or running away, or in our case, in this, this day and age, simply exercise. Good, good answers. So yeah, for exercise, um, increases heart rate, increases blood pressure, increases airflow, Increases blood glucose. Parasympathetic, on the other hand, calming effect. But assists in digestion, and bodily maintenance. When everything is functioning normally, um, the normal rate of activity is 
is maintained by both systems. And that is uh, autonomic tone. That's called auton autonomic tone. Um, parasympathetic tone. Now I'm going to start with sympathetic because that's the order I was going in. Sympathetic tone. maintains smooth muscle tone in the intestines sorry 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 scratch that scratch that let me rewind and erase I'm back to sympathetic tone. Uh, keeps blood vessels partially constricted. Partially constricted. And thus maintains blood pressure. maintains blood pressure. Um, if there's a rapid, a rapid drop in blood pressure, uh, an individual can go into shock. Sympathetic tone. Sympathetic. Parasympathetic. Sympathetic. Red for sympathetic, blue for parasympathetic. I'm going to try to remember that. Parasympathetic. Tone. Maintains smooth muscle in the intestines. Rest and digest. It holds the resting heart rate. What is your resting heart rate, do you think? What is your, have you taken your heart rate before? 60 to 100? Okay, 100 is quite high, um, but you can get 100 with resting. Um, so give or take around 72, um, so if, if, for example, you would cut the vagus nerve, then the heart would beat at about 100 beats per minute. Per minute. Would be about 100 beats per minute. So that's the intrinsic rate of the heart that is maintained by the pacemaker of the heart. So I'll make sure that you can write everything down. How's it going so far with the pace? The pace good? All right, excellent. Nice, okay. 
it's nice to see thumbs up, isn't it? It's very encouraging. Thumbs up. It's like, yahoo. <laughs> All right, let us carry on. There is a difference between the pathways of the somatic system, which is voluntary, and the autonomic, autonomic pathways, the involuntary ones. So here, for example, is the somatic efferent innervation. The fiber is extending a myelinated motor fiber directly to skeletal muscle. The effector here is skeletal muscle. You need to get used to the word effector. Effectors, it's quite common. Uh, autonomic, however, innervation occurs along the pathway of two neurons. Uh, one is called preganglionic, and the other is called postganglionic, and it is unmyelinated. There's a ganglion in the middle. where the synapse occurs. Um, in this case, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine at the synapse. At the target, which can be, these effectors are cardiac, smooth muscle and glands, can be either acetylcholine or norepinephrine, but we're going to get into neurotransmitters a little bit later. So the autonomic system has two neurons that span the distance from the central nervous system to the effectors. One is called, now this is great, here's another, uh, another structure that has two names, <laughs> preganglionic or presynaptic, postganglionic or postsynaptic. They're synonymous. So I'm going to show you another slide now. It looks complicated, but it really isn't that complicated. It's just there's a lot of stuff on it, but I will point out the important things. We're going to look first at the sympathetic system. Efferent pathways of the sympathetic nervous system. So, uh, I'm going to write a few notes right away, actually, because these are important and they're not going to fit on there. So uh, sympathetic. It's also known as the thoracolumbar system. And you just know that word's gonna show up in the crossword puzzle, <laughs> thoracolumbar. And that's because the sympathetic fibers arise from the thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord. It arises from those regions. Let me go back just for a minute. I'll come right back to this writing. I just want to show you where that is right here. That's the region, thoracic and lumbar. Good. So what is the origin of the presynaptic neurons? It is the lateral horns of gray matter
from T1 to L2. Thoracic vertebra one to lumbar vertebra two. There's an eagle right outside somewhere. I can hear it. And it's funny because these, these uh, headphones, they enhance some sounds. So if there's birds outside, I can hear them quite loudly. It's quite funny. So this leads to uh, what is known as a sympathetic chain ganglia. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a chain of ganglia that is directly beside the vertebral column. And because of that, it's also known as paravertebral, beside the vertebrae. And there are different places where that preganglionic fiber will synapse. So it may synapse in the directly adjacent ganglia. or ganglion, I should say, singular. Um, it may travel to higher or lower ganglia. In the chain itself. Or it may say, the heck with this, I'm going straight through the chain to collateral ganglia. without synapsing to collateral ganglia. So I'm going to come back to this printing in a moment, but let me just go back here. Um, yeah. No, never mind. That's not as good. Not as good as the next one. There are the sympathetic chain ganglia beside the spinal cord. Here's the one I wanted to show you. Pathways of preganglionic. So, um, it may synapse directly adjacent. It may travel elsewhere in synapse, or it may go right through and synapse in a collateral ganglion. Yeah, that's really all I wanted to show here. Now there's a lot of printing on here, but the collateral ganglion is here. This is an adjacent ganglion. And this one is another ganglion in the chain. Yeah, so the, the green fibers here are the preganglionic fibers. So that's all this is showing. 
preganglionic fibers. So in case you didn't get a chance to write everything down. Uh, so adjacent to the vertebra from which the preganglionic fiber is extending. So it's right next door. So um, maybe I can just show you. So put my drawing skills to the test. It's not going to work. <laughs> so here is the sympathetic chain ganglion. And here are the vertebrae. So if, if one is going directly adjacent, it's the one that's right next door. If it's not doing that, instead, if it's going into the spinal cord and maybe going down too, that would be traveling to higher, whoopsie, to higher or lower uh, ganglia. Or if it goes right through, it'll just go right through to a collateral ganglion. So that's what I mean. Uh, preganglionic fiber is the same as a preganglionic neuron. Yeah, I tend to use the words neuron and fiber interchangeably. Thank you for mentioning that. So two, it travels. Three, it goes right through. Yeah, that's more simplified than the diagram itself. So here is a collateral ganglion. Collateral meaning it's not in the chain. These two ganglia, this one and this one, they are in the chain. Uh, so wait a sec, I need to do some writing. Now I want to talk about postganglionic fibers. Or neurons. Now we're in still, we're still in the sympathetic system. So <laughs> there are three routes for the postganglionic fibers as well. One is the spinal nerve root. It'll just return to the spinal nerve and carry on to the effectors. Um, so this is the root most used for example, sweat glands. Sweat glands tend to use that root. Uh, you're the piloerector muscles as well. Uh, what else? Blood vessels of the skin. There's another route that that postganglionic fiber might take. That's through a sympathetic nerve.
So there are nerves that are dedicated to sympathetic fibers. And these extend to, for example, the heart, the lungs, the esophagus, and thoracic blood vessels. It's really, you know, it's really like a, a big puzzle. So we're just fitting the pieces together of this puzzle. The other root is called the splanchnic nerve root. Splanchnic. So beyond um, the ganglia, they form greater, uh, lesser, and lumbar splanchnic nerves. Sympathetic nerves form plexuses. They form plexuses. So let me show you a diagram of collateral ganglia and the abdominal aortic plexus. Here are some of the ganglia we've talked about, the celiac ganglia. These are collateral ganglia, superior mesenteric ganglion and the inferior mesenteric ganglion. Also the aortic plexus. So let me write the functions of these various plexuses. Um, basically, the celiac superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric uh, these collateral ganglia they're located at points where these arteries of the same name branch off the aorta They follow the arteries. Sorry, I didn't say that very well. The fibers. So the preganglionic fibers have synapsed with the postganglionic fibers, and the postganglionic fibers are going to travel to their target organs.
along the pathway of the arteries. And the targets are the stomach, the spleen, the liver, small intestine, kidneys, the colon, rectum, urinary bladder, and reproductive organs. So an extensive array of effectors. So in summary, do you have enough time to write that down here? Let me leave that out for a second. In summary, effectors in the body wall are innervated by sympathetic fibers in the spinal nerves, effectors in the head and thoracic cavity innervated by sympathetic nerves, and effectors in the abdominal cavity innervated by sympathetic fibers in the splanchnic nerves. A part of fight or flight includes the adrenal glands. So the adrenal glands, I don't have a picture, but say this is an adrenal gland. There are uh, two parts of the gland. There is the, uh, the outer part, that's the cortex, and the inner part is known as the medulla. So it's the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla to distinguish it from the other medulla. Yeah, so the cortex uh, just secretes hormones. It's part of the endocrine system that we're going to get to later on. But the medulla is kind of a modified sympathetic ganglion. It's a modified sympathetic ganglion, um, but it secretes hormones into the blood. They are neurotransmitters, but now they're going to act like hormones. Things like epinephrine and norepinephrine. So really, the sympathetic response is often a combination of the sympathetic nervous system and the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands tend to have a longer term effect because the neurotransmitters or hormones uh, end up in the blood. So they stay in the blood for quite a long time. Together, they're known as the sympathoadrenal system. So they function very closely together. Okay, I'm going to stop there for a moment so that each lecture isn't too terribly long.